Welcome to the Conscious Dominance Podcast, where Andrew and Eric, two dominant men in dom sub relationships, discuss how we approach our dominant roles from a conscious and loving place, and what we learn about ourselves through the deep intimacy that these power exchange dynamics make possible. Sit back and enjoy the show. Eric, welcome back to part two. Good to be here. We're going to pick up where we left off with our last episode here in talking about men and getting help and kind of this this balance between doing it for ourselves and getting assistance or being willing, I guess, to open ourselves to receiving, having somebody come alongside of us and help us, help to show us the way to where it is that we're needing to go in our growth. And a couple thoughts to pick up where we left off last time, just a couple more ideas that I wanted to share with guys. We talked a lot about EMDR therapy in that last episode. And if you haven't listened to that last one, it's great. You want to go back right now and listen to part one first, probably. But also a couple of other ways that I have either worked with myself or known people who have in getting some help or assistance is uh, hypnotherapy. Um, and then somatic experiencing is another one that is, and all of these are really based in our ability to heal these wounds rather than just avoid them and to deal with the pain so that we can put it away rather than being in constant reactivity to it. Um, <clears throat> This sort of work is also kind of like therapy. I, I like to call some of this trauma work therapy for men. Because you don't have to sit and endlessly talk about it. And a right. lot of times as guys, we don't want to sit and endlessly talk about our problems. We want to do something about them. And some of these therapy modalities that we've been talking about for this kind of assistance really are things that allow us to heal from and move beyond these kinds of pain from our past without having to sit and cycle and, and just talk about it. Because I think this may be different for women than it is for men. I don't know. But I want to make some strides forward when I'm taking the time to work on something. Yeah, no, I, I want to say... I'm about to say something and then contradict myself. Like I'm going to offer two things. <laughs> I have found talk therapy to be very helpful and very unhelpful. And if there's no way I would be here without it, but there's no way I, I would be here now only with it. So it is helpful in conjunction with something else. And I feel like healing is not a one thing. Like I feel like it, there it comes that you have to come at it from and for each person it's different you might what works for you might not work for someone else another thing that's helped me is actually um psilocybin and so but that's also something that that you have to be careful with because you can get into where that's just kind of an excuse to avoid your work so I've found that with the right person holding space for you, there can be a very positive experience with altered states. I think that the one of the key ingredients for all of this is that we have to have some initially someone else that's able to hold space for us and offer us unconditional positive regard while we're going through that trauma so they can model to us what it is we eventually want to have within ourselves. What I find to be healing is that I start to experience unconditional positive regard for myself. The most powerful thing that I'm starting to have, far more than Kurt, everything else, is self-compassion. When I start to have self-compassion, I start to not being triggered. I actually become much more resilient. I become much less brittle. I become much tougher because it's often when I'm being hard on myself that I 
my emotions get jacked, that I get triggered, that I get angry, that I find all these other spaces. But in order to get to the self-compassion, I had to ha be around other people that modeled that for me. And so that capacity to hold space, and I actually met Rachel through her capacity to hold space. Like she's somebody who her work with Rosha, she's very, very gifted. I didn't meet her. I don't want to confuse things in saying that, that I hired her or anything like that. But when I first was romantically involved with her, I was also, we, I ended up getting help from her. And, and her work and her capacity to hold space was very powerful. And again, like I said, I had to leave that behind and, and learn that from my own. But she was incredibly gifted for me. And she has this incredible movement practice that I found to be really healing as well. And so her work was also very powerful for me. But in many ways, like what she offered and what I got through MDR and what I got through psilocybin and all this, what, what's, what's, the, what's the constant through all of that? is that I go to an altered state where I'm re-traumatized and there is somebody else who's able to hold space for me, myself in that situation and not judge it, not condemn it, not try to fix me, not try to make it better, not try to come in and, and mend it, but is able to just sit and be with it. And that can pass. And that, what I, what I then am starting to be able to do for myself it's ironic, but the way to healing and the way to get better is actually through accepting ourselves, surrendering to what is. And yep. we've talked about this a lot before, but it's actually like you have to have two paradigms. There's one paradigm when you're going through healing, and there's one paradigm when you're getting shit done. And they're two totally different paradigms. They're different rules. There's a different model. It's a different system. It's a different operating system. They're not the same operating system. When you're going through healing work, and when you're getting shit done, two different operating systems. And most men try to apply the getting shit done model to healing work, doesn't work because you get frustrated with yourself. And you, you feel like you're just, this is just annoyance yeah. and it's annoying and it's, you don't want to deal with it and you become impatient. You I know you, I want smart, you to hear what you have to say. You can't set smart goals on no, healing you work. <laughs> no, you can't. No. You know, so we talked a lot about in part one of this topic about using things like books and podcasts and information as resources for help and assistance and guidance. We talked about getting help around therapy work and, and emotional work. The next place I would love to go with this is a place that I think a lot of men avoid getting help and that is around sexual education. And really, because there's an epidemic of bad sex. Yes. It's, unbelievable how bad the sex is that most people are having and this is doesn't all fall on men but i think men are far less willing to learn from places other than porn how to Porn's really give <laughs> how to really give pleasure to a woman and if there's one thing that a guy I think a guy could do to add to his relationship, it would be to learn how to slow down and really be present with your partner's pleasure. But when we start taking this, like we talked about in the last episode here, the beginner's mind, really being willing to look at things like we don't know everything and that we have a lot to learn. And if we try to bring that approach into sex and sexuality and pleasure with our partner, we're challenging some pretty deeply held beliefs and probably some pretty fundamental things about ourselves as men, because we're saying, you know what, maybe I'm not the best lover. Maybe I'm not the best giver of pleasure. Maybe I can be better at this and get, we can be better at everything all the time, but admitting that we can improve and maybe even should improve and be better than we are when it comes to giving pleasure, whether that's in a vanilla relationship or a kinky one. Accepting help and education around how to go about doing that challenges some pretty fundamental deep shit for us as guys. And it 
it's hard to do and it's also really really important a hundred percent agree i have my own personal stories with that that i'll share but i i think most men treat sex like they treat doing the dishes like they just do it they don't think much about it it's like here's how we do it you just kind of do it and you get it done like there's not a whole lot of thought that goes into it and it seems like she's enjoying herself and i feel good so i must be good at it right (laughs) and most of the time a lot of women uh faking it They're, they're they're actually placating you they are actually not fully owning what's the reality of the situation and even and, if they're not even if they're not faking it, they are not enjoying themselves to the extent that they could if correct. their man was being more present, more attentive, correct. more focused on her pleasure and less correct. on either getting it over with or you know, whatever wherever he's running off to in his own mind. It's so true. And I think like you mentioned before, porn does so much damage to men's sexuality. I, I feel like there's a great um, health, but it's not a diet, but you know, it's kind of like a diet. It's called Whole30, something that I've done before mm-hmm. with Rachel. And it's where you take away certain foods just to get it like a reset. I feel like there needs to be some type of like whole year or whole three years, like whatever your thought about porn is, no matter who you are, stop it for a long time. Like pick a period of time and just quit. Cold turkey, 100%. And I'm talking everything that's sexualized. I'm talking those YouTube videos that you click on with the cute girls that are playing sports. I'm talking every sexualized thing that's in your feed. Get rid of all of it. Get rid of everything. Reconfigure our mind to desexualize it take a cold plunge in that regard and then start over and start being like, I don't know how to do sex. I had to do that. I came in with lots of sexual experience. I came in with many different sexual partners and I came in thinking that I was great at sex, having been told that I was great at sex and then came with Rachel. I came to a point where I was like, we kind of came to a place where I was like, "Eh, I'm not as great as I think I am. I damn near had a meltdown. I did have a meltdown. I had a point where I completely was like the perception of myself, the view that I had of myself collapsed. And it took a moment for me to come back, but it only came back through humility. It only came back through me being like, I don't actually know how to touch. I don't know how to lick. I don't know how to be gentle. I don't know how to be slow. I don't know how to do foreplay. I don't know how to do uh, anticipation. I don't know how to create mood and and create a situation that that drags it out. I don't know necessarily how to mind fuck as well as I'd like to. Another book that's good about mind fuck, by the way. But I don't. I didn't know these things. I thought I did. I was kind of did it uh, impulsively. I did it uh, just off the cuff. And it, I didn't have the meticulousness. I didn't have the, the impeccability. I didn't have the humility. And if you can take humility, when I started taking humility and a gentleness and a softness and a slowness, and then combined it with this ferocious animal nature that is sort of my nature, and you bring the two together, that becomes a superpower. It's, it's not just want it's having range and having what is necessary in what moment and sex is a lot more like playing an instrument and then having the instrument be like playing three or four different instruments and then having the instruments actually change the way they are in midstream and having to know what instrument is different at the rate and so like what and being attuned to her body and being attuned to her situation and not coming in with a premeditated situation and having awareness and all the things that we've talked about. And it's much more in my energy field and me being aware of where she is and what she's feeling that has helped my sex more than anything is just being attuned to her body and attuned to her needs and what she's at and her pleasure. 
And it's being able to go from like zero to one, to two, to three, to linger at three, go back down to two, go back to one, linger at one, go up to four, go back down and be able to play that note and then, and linger way over there and then come over. And this is all like, as far as like hard, uh, slow and fast or hard, you know, as, as a range, build up a momentum and then go ferocious. A lot of guys want to go from zero to nine or zero to 10. It's like taking a car and just going Rrr! and then, and they're one hit wonder and they think they're a stud because they can just jackhammer her. And what it is to have nuance, what it is to control the moment, like everything you're talking about, I feel very passionate about it because I have been that guy. Just like I said before, I am the before picture on all these fronts. <laughs> I think I think we all are. And anybody who's taken the the ego hit to get knocked down a few rungs in our view of ourself so that we can learn what it is that we didn't know can always see the before and the after I think in in yourself in these things so where does a guy go to actually learn these skills in your opinion or in your experience where does it how does a guy who wants to be a great lover learn the skills to do that well i think first of all those skills are multi fast there's the actual skill of the act and those different things but guys get so caught up in that and think that's like playing an instrument like how do you do the finger and how does this mm -hmm. happen and how do we get it like this and where does the tongue go da, 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 da. Yeah, they the ignore... the, i call that button pushing right it, that's the yeah. button pushing piece of button it pushing that's that's actually like way less important than what most men think when we talk about sexual skills, that's all they're thinking about. And what I realize is that's way more important is to be able to play with energy and to play with her energy and to understand where she's at and be able to own her. And there's actually another great book called Attuned. It's about being able to read other people and really be that that nation that we're talking about with healing. This is why it's been really helpful for to me to do that healing work, because as I'm attuned to myself and then I start to be attuned to her, then I can see where she's at and then I can lead her energy and move that energy and play with that energy. And then I, what, what we're trying to get all sex is especially for women, especially is anticipation. If we realize that what we want to do is increase the anticipation. We want to, the joy and the pleasure comes from her anticipating something. And then being able to like play with that and then give, give it or not give it and play with that energy. It's sex is more like a really good movie or really good music than it is one act. Music, there's a mood, there's an art, there's a whole thing. Sex is more, much more like an art than it is like programming your computer. It's, 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 it's about knowing dosage. It's about knowing timing. It's about knowing what time of the month it is for her. It's about knowing what happened. It's about laying some seeds earlier in the day and then coming back to them and then following it up and then creating a whole scene or situation with that. You can have the most epic sex, powerful sex on a fucking Tuesday and a random thing when she's in a shit ass mood, if you do it right. Like, it's not up to her, it's up to you. And most women, if you can take charge and you really understand how to play with energy and then of course have some skills, but you don't need to nearly have those skills as much as you think you do. If you can work the energy she's just yours like she just becomes putty in your hands so so, this, I'm gonna so what i'm saying is learn how to play with energy i'm going to try not to get us kicked off of youtube here <laughs> <laughs> you agree with me i know oh 100 percent, i agree with you and the reason that i agree with you is that One of the ways that we talk about this in our house is that 
I can dominate and control Don with one finger. <laughs> I don't need to be forceful. I don't need to be commanding. I don't need to be controlling because I can play her like a fiddle with just the tip of my index finger. And this is where I think if you were a guy who wants to be a better lover and you're taking this podcast as the place that you're going to get some more information and you want to be a better lover, start with the tip of your finger and just stroke her. Touch her and watch her reaction. Run your finger up and down different places in her body and feel her and how she's reacting to it. Watch her breath. Watch the way that her skin changes color. Watch where she takes a deep breath. Like, notice her. This is what we're talking about when we're talking about playing with energy. This is just the practical how you play with energy. If you see something that really gets a certain reaction, don't just go there really hard and think, 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 think. like, don't just keep pushing that button, pull away from that and then come back to it again. Does it give you the same reaction? Does it build when you go back to touching her that way and then pull away from it? You said anticipation, and I love that word. The way that I say that same thing is my objective is to make her want more. Exactly. And the only way to make her want more is to take it away and then give it to her and then pull back. And it's almost like this game of push-pull where the pleasure starts to lean into her and then she starts to lean back into the pleasure, but then you pull it away and she's like, catch me. And then you catch her with more pleasure and you pull her back up and you just, you can really go a long way with the tip of your finger. You it's know? a great, great advice. And I, you know, something you told me before too, is pick one thing, you know, whether it's your tip of your finger, your tongue, your, it could be your pinky, your thumb, like it could be your elbow. It doesn't fucking matter. It, but what, what you're saying there is pick, something very small so you can start feeling that it's not about being like you said, it's not about being forceful. It's not just about, it's about technique because any modality, any technique, any place you want to go, that's the result of you. That's you think about it, your job is to create a frame. Your job is to create the energetic architecture of the situation. And then what takes place in that she's going to be alive to you could come in like someone else could come in and touch her. It doesn't matter that you're the person who does it. I mean, it could be, she could do it herself. Whatever you are, this is where and you as, as the Dom need to know what terms you want and what you like because you will want to do more of that and you'll get better at it. So figure out what you're actually aroused by. Some guys don't even need to touch women. They don't, they're not into that. They just want to mentally control them. Some guys want to tie them up. Some guys want, you know, it could be anything. It could be you want them to sit there and there's a no touch thing and it's it's a hypnotic kind of quality. Or it could be something where you just hands. This sort of pe penis and vagina, pe that is such a limited view of what sex is. And it's not at all, think of that as like one part of the buffet. Like there's a massive buffet that's out there. And I think sometimes when we talk about sexual education, we're so struck on like, well, how do I fuck it? What angle at this thing kind of like this is like, mm -hmm. it's like think talking about how to cook a steak and thinking that's learning how to cook. Like there's so much different variety of what it means to cook. I mean, there's many genres all over the world, all over kind of things. This is a different paradigm of control. Exactly. Because control as forcefulness is, it is one way of exerting control. But there's an entirely different world of control that's an entirely different level of fun when force isn't required at all. She's already done. You're past forced. Exactly. It, it's unnecessary. Here's a, another great example. If you want to play with bondage, you can play with toys, cuffs, spreader bars, all these things. You know where I think is a great place to start? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to cross your wrists like this 
and you are not allowed to move them until I tell you to. Correct. Okay, first of all, from a safety perspective, if you're new at exploring this, is she in danger at all at this point? <laughs> no. no. She's not, has none of the physical control taken away from her. It's completely a mental thing. Yep. But we're giving her then an opportunity to surrender to us, to follow that, to, and then ourselves an opportunity to play with her as though she is in, out of control, but just from a choice rather than from a force. And that's a whole different level. So there's so much we could go for hours on this. And I, I think we have other. Well, one other thing I just want to say is creativity and storytelling, I think are also really undervalued and under indexed. And one thing that Rachel and I really enjoy is, is, is storytelling. It's something where I'll create a scenario. It's imagination, really it's play. Mm -hmm. And we don't have necessarily, you don't need any props. Sometimes we dress up, sometimes there's a prop, but that, that direction can go any direction. I mean, we can literally inhabit animals or gods or, or characters or Marvel or, or people or random neighbors or whatever, whoever you want it to be, friend, you know, whatever it, 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 it can go. It's infinite possibilities mm -hmm. that can be what, your, your imagination. I was and just that, picturing you pretending to be Aquaman in a scene. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, but you know what I'm talking about here. And so yeah. that capacity to tell a story, the capacity to, to, to inhabit the story and then create a scene. And that scene and that story can lie dormant and then come back up months later or weeks later. And all you have to do is mention the character or mention a little reference from that. And that's wickedly fun. It's way fun. And it's something you can do in public because you could just be in your imagination and you could be in character. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, you got to watch out for that too because it can go pretty intense and pretty far. You got to be careful. It's one, one thing that she and I have learned that it's it's not to be done at, by, like it can be, it's almost like taking a, a drug or drinking. You, you, you get into a, another state at a place. You got to be, you got to make sure you do aftercare and you're careful and you create a frame and don't, don't think it's just play like it has a real power to it the mind is is the by far the largest and most powerful sexual organ and i think that's the place that if you're a man and you want to improve your skills in this area start looking at the mind and start figuring yes. out the how the mind yours hers how that can take you beyond the button pushing and into something that is far more enjoyable for both of you. Yes. Yes. Truth. Very, very, very accurate. And I feel like language is also something that's really helpful. Being meticulous with language and how you use words. I feel like studying really good comedians is actually fun, is helpful. <laughs> they, they that's an be... interesting approach. Tell, tell me more about that. Well, I think really good comedians will tell a joke and you don't even realize it's a joke. Like they, they're able to kind of weave it in there and it, this whole story and tell and create a scene. And they're, they're impeccable with their words and their timing and they, they play off of things and energy. And think of, of that as a way to tell a story or a, a mood or create a situation with a woman where it comes off like you haven't done any preparation at all. Like it comes off really natural, but you've actually spent hours and days working hard to make it look like you're not working at all. And I think comedians are masters at that, where they really good comedians make it feel like they're not trying. It's just natural. They're just sort of doing it. They're winging it. And that quality is something that I love to bring to her. It feels spontaneous. It feels like I'm winging it. It feels like I just, just did it. It doesn't feel like a canned line or something or like, oh, I'm in this thing i'm doing a story and, and and i think that's where a lot of the things that we're saying if you if you don't bring a sort of a naturalness to it it can feel a little stiff at first it can feel foolish it can feel awkward and that's where like look at the masters of people in their craft or magicians you know people that are really really good at their craft they feel almost effortless in it and when you said study the mind i feel like the mind coming together with an audience, with humor, with awareness 
is a great comedian. And I think a great lover has a lot more similarity to a great comedian than we realize. What are some of the other places or areas of life that you see men benefiting from or where you have benefited from seeking outside assistance, connecting with other humans to learn, to grow? Sports, physical therapy, medical world. You know, anytime I'm just injured right now, pretty bad, and I'm going to see a physical therapist, uh, trainer, those things are massively helpful. And men, most men will go do that. You know, if you're at all serious about a sport, you get help, you get coaching, you go, there's no problem. You have not, I mean, the best athletes in the world have a whole team of people teaching them. And I think that's a great example of that, where you see people that are at the highest places getting very humble and wanting to learn things and even being open to hear and talk about the fundamentals. So I think that's a great example of where that is. And I think sports and sex are actually very similar too, in the sense of like there's technique, there's strategy. And in the moment, you got to just be able to be, how quickly can you react? Can there be a moment? Can you own it? Can, and a lot of things that are valued in sports are also valued in the bedroom. Confidence really at the end of the day matters. It matters. And being able to own the space. And if you get another thing that, I mean, this, I'm going to take this a little bit else, but if you get a soft dick, if you get soft, there's nothing like getting soft and then staying cool about it and being confident. Just like, it's cool. Just, just be like, it's all cool, you know, and just, and then love her and grab her and being able to not let that moment like flatten you or rock you and just dominate the energy and like just be able to take that and then move it into something else and, and pivot. It's like a great athlete or a great comedian where like the joke doesn't land or they, 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 they fell or something works and then be able to pick up and then just adjust and pivot. That quality of being in real time, being able to pivot with confidence that's a massively important skill. And I feel like that's where the healing work pays off because when you do the healing work, those things like that trigger you less. And, and I feel like it's in those moments where, or she might say something or she puts up a little resistance or she's like, no, I'm not quite like, uh, I'm not, you, you gotta be able to, it's, it's often, I, I don't know if I can say this, I'm just gonna say, it. most women's nose in a, in a relationship where they're into you it's just not right the way you're asking. Not not now. Not the way you're you're not like at. that. Not like that. And yes. if you take their no to be uh a, a no, then you're missing it. And it's kind of like well, the same go ahead. Let, let me just add something to that for the sake of nuance here. What we're kind of getting at is the the difference in a safe word of yellow and a safe word of red. Yes, exactly. Right? Because right. No can mean not like that, not right now, um, not with you, <laughs> or it can mean fuck no, stop, I'm done, I'm out. Like, right, right. And, and we have to be able to discern the difference there. She needs to be Correct. able to communicate the difference as well in, right. in an ideal world that you've, and that's a part of what these power dynamics can really do is give us the opportunity to have communication and language around how we're going to handle no and how we're going to handle not right now and how we're going to handle these different things and have those kind of baked into the structure of the relationship. But you're a hundred percent right that we, we need to be connected enough to her experience to understand what it is that she's feeling in that moment to know what to do with it and not overreact or just shut down. One of my biggest, hardest patterns to overcome. You've talked a lot about some of your big, your big ones. One of my biggest one was any little bit of resistance. I would just quit. I, as soon as there was any like, like can you, you get that little like eh, or the, the little ouch or you know whatever it is, and I would just be like, yeah, fuck it. You're not really into this anyway. And I would just pull right. back and quit. 
Yeah. And like that is that was the the defeatist victim um self loathing, lack of self worth, like all summed up into one. Um <clears throat> another area where I think I would like to spend a little time here because another thing I think we undervalue a lot as men is our looks, our appearance, mm-hmm. our grooming. And we think we can, like, we've got that all figured out. And then you look at most men in most places and like, you do not have that shit figured out. So no, I think that's a really, 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 really important point. It's something that Rachel's really talked to me a lot about. Like your nails, for example, that I, I mean, guys need to cut their nails and they need to, they need to take care of your nails. You have great freedom, that touch that you're talking about. If you've got the nails poking and they're dirty and you're wash your hands, but it seems like a little thing. It's not a little thing. That's a, that's a one example among many that we could, we could come yeah. up with. And there's a lot of little stuff like that, but specifically on this topic, we're talking about of getting help, get yourself a really good barber or hairstylist that you trust that helps you not only just give you a cheap haircut every month or six weeks or whatever it is, but that helps you figure out a style that fits your, the shape of your head. So this is a place we can lean into help. We can get a haircut that actually makes us look better rather than just getting the, the hair buzzed off our head, which I need terribly right now and i get to go and see my barber tomorrow and i can't freaking wait um but lean on the people that are experts to help you look your best clothes are another one go into a a, go into a men's clothing store and say you know what i've been a t-shirt and jeans guy my whole life and i kind of like the t-shirt and jeans look but can you help me make myself look the best that i can with and this doesn't mean you have to go be a suit guy. It doesn't mean that you have to go get all fancy. But lean on the expertise of people who know this stuff and who can help you make the most out of how you look. And this is a great place to lean into help if if styling, hairstyling, picking out clothes, if like I don't can't tell you how many men in my life and in my past have just basically let their wife go to the store and buy some clothes and then they get, she comes home, throws them in the drawer and that's what he wears. Like take a little bit of responsibility for your looks and for your style and for your, your clothing and for your grooming and your appearance. Like get some good tools. Don't just use the cheap shit. Like get a good beard trimmer. If you keep facial hair, deal with your fucking ear hair and your eyebrows, get, Get some education around how to take care of yourself and make yourself look your best because it pays dividends. Put lotion on. I mean, little things I, I didn't used to do, but proper lotion, you know, proper soap. All these little details, they actually matter as the time goes on, as you get older, how you tend, to, tend your body. You know, also another place that I've gotten help from is diet and food and talking to people and and getting help with cooking and getting help with people uh rachel's a great resource for that for me but there there's figuring out what the right food for your body taking it i took a food sensitivity test and figured out that i was actually sensitive to a lot of these foods that gave me stomach issues or that caused a certain like figure that shit out like you should know by now what food works for you and what doesn't get help to figure that out. Yeah. And the last one that I have to talk about is, is medically. Yeah. This is a place where I have just avoided getting any help around my health for most of my life up until the last five to seven years. And if you can find a really solid doctor, that you trust that especially one that that specializes in men and men's health that you can lean into 
their expertise. So I go in now every quarter, every three months, and I get my blood work done. They look at all of my labs and set up a customized supplementation protocol for me. How much vitamin D do I need to be taking instead of just buying the shit off of Amazon and taking it? Like, how much do I need to be taking? How often? Um, supplementing with diet, with food. Like, what foods do I need to be eating more of? Iron is a little bit low. Let's bump up the red meat intake um, because I give blood pretty frequently. So my iron can get a little bit low. So I need to bump up iron-rich foods. So, again, take a hands-on approach to your life and get some help from the experts around your health because that's the one thing you can't ever get back if you if you let it go too far. All right. And we, we really start to see this as guys. Like, we're both in our mid-40s now. I don't know. You might be edging past the mid, but <laughs> the... The things that didn't matter in my 30s matter a lot more in my 40s. And I start looking at 20 years from now, I'm in my 60s. And how I handle my health over these next 20 years probably plays a lot into the quality of life in then the following 20 years from my 60s to my 80s. So I'm putting a lot of emphasis on leaning into the expertise of people and I'll in my case, the way I approach this, I don't just take a Western medicine approach to health. I don't want to say like, I just go to the doctor, they take my blood, they say, you know, I take a very hands-on approach to learning about this, to understanding health from a more holistic perspective and take a really a lifestyle and dietary first approach to my overall health, not a pills first approach to my overall health. But again, I didn't know this stuff. I had to lean on people who did. I think that's a great example. Really, really important. And one that uh, hits close to home. It's something that I have not always prioritized. And as that adage says, you know, if you don't make health a priority, it will make it itself a priority. Like, it will make itself. And this last year I've had to make it a priority and it's been a real eye opening on, on multiple levels and multiple issues. And I totally agree with you. And I think the holistic going back to where we started with the mental health, more and more do I see that mental health plays a role in physical health. And then a lot of times we can't separate the two. And then a lot of times our stress or our uh, trauma, that these issues actually impact our illnesses or actually have these these certain ailments that happen. And, and one of the things that's been really helpful for me is that times when I'm sick or times when I'm injured, can I see those times as learning opportunities? Can I see them as rites of passage? Can I see them as places where I'm gonna actually grow from this experience? And so having the right mindset with that is also really helpful. Yes, getting the help, totally agree. But part of the help is to get the right frame around whatever experience I'm going through so that maybe I need a little bit more help psychologically during those periods of time. Maybe I need to actually come to Andrew and say, dude, I'm going through it right now. It sucks. And just saying that and being able to like, yeah, I see that it sucks. Like, that's it. Like, it's amazing what just owning it, not looking to play the victim card, not looking to be like, oh, what was me? Cause that, that's not what I'm talking about here, but I am saying is sometimes we actually do need legitimate support and help, but there's a big difference between getting help and using it as an excuse to stay where we are and getting help because we want to move forward and we want to transform and we want to get better and we want to grow and we want to heal. And that really does take us to a place where you have to kind of be both gritty, but also have a bit of grace with yourself. So going back to that same idea of self-compassion, along with the resilient, you know, more of that sort of perseverance that goes with that. Yeah, it doesn't make me a victim to reach out to you and tell you, like, I'm really having a hard time with something. Right. You know, that doesn't make me a victim to admit that I'm having a hard time with it. What makes me a victim is if I attach to that and then really 
like choose to live in that rather than just let it be true for now. So this is some language I love around this. This comes from a guy named Peter Crone. He says that we have to see ourselves as both a masterpiece and a work in progress. That's good and, language for that. And this is what I'm talking about here is when things aren't going well, it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm still okay on a big picture scale. I'm still okay. And if I didn't have anyone to go to, would I survive? Yeah. But if I can reach out to a friend, if I can reach out to an expert when I need some knowledge or information on something that I don't know, whatever, I have to be able to see myself as a work in progress. And the fact that I'm not perfect doesn't mean that I'm a failure. It means that I'm just in a stage of growth and improvement around this. I'm in a stage of a challenge that I'm maybe don't even see the path to overcome yet. But it's, it's still a path that I'm going to overcome. It's true. So any you know, last like thoughts? Life's fun or it's school. You know, it's like it's either we're either learning or, you know, something my sister would always say. It's either fun or it's training, right? <laughs> It's either summer vacation or it's the school year, one or the other. <laughs> so I hope the message that guys take away from this in, in listening to this is really that acceptance of being able to reach out and lean on other people and to do so in a way that helps you, but also to recognize that you are still doing this for yourself, even by asking for help and that it's actually a really valuable and helpful thing to be able to accept help. Yeah. And I want to just say one thing that ultimately that really, really, really important. The whole point is to gain more and more agency of our life. So it's not that yes. we go to get help to hand over agency to someone else. And what I mean by agency, I mean authority. Like, I mean, are we going to someone else so they have the ultimate authority? Are we going to another guru or someone to get help from and then they're going to tell us what to do and then we're going to follow lockstep with them? That's not at all what I, we're talking about. We're just saying getting help in that moment, it's like the beginner's mind, it's the beginning. And then as we keep moving forward, we're always sort of at the beginning of something. But it's never to hand over agency for our whole life. Ultimately, all of this is so we can take more responsibility for ourselves and be less the victim and more authority, more self-authority, more authorship, more agency. Yeah. And really sovereignty is another great word there. Great to, word. To great gain word. sovereignty over our own lives. Sometimes we have to accept that we don't have all the skills, knowledge, perspective that we need in order to have that full agency or sovereignty to feel that, that sense of inner dominance. That's a word or a phrase we both like to use. We need, we sometimes need more than our current set of resources. And that's what we're talking about here and being willing to seek out support and help from other people. Help getting help is really the manifestation of humility. Yes. It's kind of a way to think about it. It's like in humility is always necessary. So when you're hum when you're feeling humble, you do something and the doing of it is getting help often. I think that's the mic drop right there. Humility <laughs> is a manifestation. I mean, getting help is the manifestation mm -hmm. of humility. Yep. Great mic drop. Great way to end this. Hey, these have been two really great episodes and I, I appreciate you bringing up this topic. Um, look forward to hearing from the men who listen to this. Reach out to us and let us know how this impacted you. We love hearing your feedback and your comments. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Eric.